Now it's going to be performance related, I think. Uh, so um, thank you for generous words, Teresa. Um, entrapped indeed. I, I avoided replying to Ken's emails last year for, I think, probably five months uh, until I was finally entrapped. And now look at the state I've got myself in. So uh, here we go. And that pattern of ignoring emails, I must say, has continued throughout much of the organisation. Uh, still, but uh, right, we've got to quarter two. Is that okay? I've thought minutes on this. So um, I'm a bit of a wanderer, I'm afraid. So filming is going to be difficult. Um, the left hand side of my brain doesn't work, so I need to stand on this side. Um, obviously, one of the main themes of extraction that we're going to be uh, considering is what many people perceive Cornwall to be all about, mining and extractive industry. I approach this as, uh, as a geologist. I've worked here for 20 years, and I've been involved both with uh, local industry, but I use uh, the network of special sites of special scientific interest for teaching undergraduate students. A uh, bit of an all-round enthusiast, both the landscape, but also for the resources that we get from the landscape. Um, if I come across as being a little weary, um, <laughs> earlier today, um, with my three children, I was at Land's End to see the uh, overhyped arrival of the uh, torch available to each runner for £200 a shot, which is great. So here's Ben Ainsley just setting off on his run. And um, obviously that had got me thinking. And some of you were out drinking last night, I guess, and gallivanting around in a bit of Cornish wrapping and stuff like that. So, I think it's never too early to move into a bit of audience participation, just so we can get some ground rules. Um, this is the structured part of my talk before Tyrus sort of took over. Um, so, I think it's a little bit like uh, Have I Got News For You? Uh, and I think what we'll do is the, uh, the connection round. That's okay. I want to touch on a few themes that underpin uh, resources. So, nicely choreographed, the bronze medal, London 2012. All right. The connection with South Crofty Mine, where uh, some of us visited yesterday, which closed down in 1998. Kennecott Mine, Utah, United States, one of the biggest holes in the ground. And the Eden Project core building. Any suggestions? <laughs> Don't be shy, we know each other very well already. <laughs> Connection, so copper is one of the things. What, what do you want to link between what? If you'll excuse the English one time. What would you like to link? Copper from where to where? Okay, so copper from Kennecott, where's that ended up? Bronze medal, yeah, okay. So 97%, 94%, 97% of the bronze medals being used at the Olympics in London are actually from Bingham Canyon, all right, one of the largest mines in the world. Interesting. Any other connections? Oh, come, come. I know, <laughs> but you know, this is maybe a little bit. Another one. Tim yeah. from South Crofty, also in Bronze. You're a good man, and we didn't even organise this last night, did we? <laughs> no, no, we didn't. Okay, so we've actually got 1.5% of the tin, obviously tin and copper make bronze, right? We define part of our civilization on the basis of what we could extract and smelt. We go from Stone Age, we move <coughs> through to Bronze Age, we move to Iron Age, right? So part of our civilization is defined by what we could get out of the ground. And the bronze metal includes 1.5% tin from South Crofty, which is a neat trick because it closed down 14 years ago. <laughs> but they stockpiled enough material to make jewellery, great value-added product, and is going to the bronze medals as well. Okay, it's got an odd one out round, so is there anything else we've missed? Not to patronise you. Anything, any other connections? Cladding. Cladding. Any further? <laughs> Come on, project. Eden Project cladding, go on. Copper. Yeah, the copper roof at the core. Where's that from? Kennecott Mine, Utah. Yeah, Kennecott Mine, Utah. And it's being uh, used as an example of ethical sourcing. Because the company that runs this mine is actually a British company, joint listed British Australian, Rio Tinto. Some of the people on my trip yesterday sold their souls, and I had them all in Rio Tinto hard hats as we were going around the site. You could see the pain as they were doing it. But um, there are obviously major issues facing the minerals industry, but even are trying to lead the way, both in terms of ethical sourcing, companies that have 
uh, policies that ensure that local communities will benefit uh, from uh, mineral extraction, and also companies that can demonstrate aftercare following the closure of a mine like this. Any other link? Uh, redundant miners from South Crofty working at Eden Project. Possible? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Number one. What could coppers use to guard the plane? Oh, I've been thinking of that, but we've started to get a little bit... Uh, they're all very good suggestions, as you say, to enthusiastic children. All right? Well, obviously, Eden is a big hole in the ground as well, which is like this hole in the ground. She just said Cornish technology. Cornish technology, yes, indeed. Right. There was export of mining technology as we move westward through the state. There's also a slightly more sinister link, because Rio Tinto actually used to own South Crofty but then flogged it as soon as the tin price started to fail. And they own this one, but they haven't flogged that one yet. All right, so a little bit of uh, globalization, a little bit of how uh, big business works uh, as well. Okay, well done, Um So let's move on. Why do we do it? Is this just some random activity of earth raping multinationals? <coughs> Is it? No. It is. Right, so uh, I think um, what I'd like to investigate now is who isn't reliant on metals in this room. Ah. So actually, we're starting to acknowledge, or at least realise, that we all create a demand for this. So who has a smartphone? Come on, come on. And I know that all of you artists have got a Mac hidden somewhere. Isn't this right? <laughs> Not in my nose, I know. Right, so smartphones, your Macs, touchscreen technology using extremely val valuable and rare material, indium and many other rare earth metals. Most of you, I know not all of you, will drive around in little metal boxes known as cars. You use copper wiring to get your electricity. You're all in this up to your eyeballs. You create the demand. Some of you, maybe a few of you, will have pensions. And those pensions, in many cases, will be underpinned by uh, institutional pension holders in some of the world's biggest companies, which include Earth Resources companies. You can choose whether or not you want to be vegetarian, whether you want to not be involved in meat production. There is no one in this room who can actually not say they're involved in the production and the demand for metals. Right? And that's something you need to be, uh, be aware of. So, the trick is, how do we do this to avoid the horrendous issues that historically and in many places still occur related to environmental despoliation, related to uh, mono-industrial cultures where a mine, because it's a finite resource, as Ian was saying in his keynote, what happens when the mine closes? How do we try and build into a community what happens next, the next stage? And that's what many of the biggest companies are actually starting to grapple with. Is it because they're altruistic? No, not necessarily. It's because it makes sense, because those same institutional shareholders actually want to ensure that we're moving forward in the right direction. So they're responding to concerns about how their share price investment is affected by bad practice. So things are moving in the right direction. So let's move on. We've accepted that we're all somehow involved in this. Or at least most of you have. Some of you are still thinking about it, I know, but you are. <laughs> and let's just think about the Cornish minerals industry, because when we talk about the Cornish minerals industry, we tend to just think about metals. But actually, um, I made up some figures last night, all right, about three o'clock this morning. Um, China clay has undergone contraction. China clay is an altered uh, granite, forms kaolinite, used for paper, used for ceramics, used for lots of different things, paint, uh, fillers, etc even used in plastics and car bumpers, things like that. It's worth about 100 million pounds a year annually. Two companies, the huge multinational Imaris, French company, and also a much smaller Goombi. Over a thousand jobs, primarily based in St. Austell, related to the extraction of, of this material. The industry is definitely contracting. Um, if we go back 20 years, there will be 4,000 people employed within it. But we're still looking probably at a lifespan 20, 25 years realistically. And there is still investment going on in terms of ex uh, exploration and trying to optimise what's going on there. Quarrying, so extraction of stone. Some of you went yesterday to Penn Lee Quarry uh, and understand some of the issues there. Obviously, they, there has been plans to try and extract armour stone for sea defence work there. Um, quarrying within Cornwall, probably about 20 million uh, a year. Still quite important. The nearest quarry to us 
Castlandinas at the top of the hill out above Penzance. Very novel for the UK. It's owned by Cornwall Council. So they're that they wouldn't be only that the only council that I'm aware of that owns their own quarry. And that's largely used for road surfacing type projects um, to try and save costs to the council taxpayer. Uh, right, consultancy. Um, Cornwall's link internationally we've kind of touched upon in other themes already, but there are actually some quite <coughs> large companies who provide expertise to the mineral sector globally that are based in Cornwall. Uh, Wardle Armstrong, SGS Mineral Services, based at the old uh, Wheel James site, and many other independents. So, very difficult to tie that down, but it's actually quite an important <coughs> employer uh, locally. Education research, what I'm involved with, School of Mines. It's the only School of Mines left in the country, the only place you can learn to be a mining engineer. And we generate quite a lot of money <coughs> just fed back into the local area. Our students, about 300 students, pay into the local economy as well. And finally, metal mining, at the bottom of the list. The current spend <coughs> on metal mining is related to the exploration uh, going on at South Crofty and it's at the bottom of the list. So the first thing I want to challenge is the fact that everything is to do with metal mining. It's not. In <coughs> fact, for almost all of the 20th century, China clay production, the number of jobs and the total revenue far outstripped the generation of income and jobs due to metal mining. Globalisation, prices, Ian was talking about what the market means, can you buck the market, as Mrs Thatcher sort of implied you couldn't. Probably not, as we can see in terms of what's happening at the moment in the present markets. Um, this is what happened in 1985, when the cartel that was artificially keeping the price of tin high collapsed. And we saw a very significant reduction to about a third of the price of tin over a very short period of time. And that is what resulted in the closure of the mines in this area. Giva, Wheel Jane, and South Crofty carried on remarkably to this position here. Carried on for basically another 12 years. In part due to the richness of its reserves, in part due to selling off other packets of land. And there is this perception that mineral extraction has been associated with low paid jobs throughout this area. But if we look at the history of mining, Alan Buckley will be talking about this later on this afternoon. If we get to the 1890s, the industry was on its knees for various periods of resurgence, early 1900s, after the First World War, and then from the late 50s through the 60s, 70s and early 80s, these were boom years because the prices were being kept artificially high by this cartel. They stabilised and most of the jobs associated with mining in Cornwall were very, very well paid jobs in terms of the local community. And that's why it had such a dramatic effect after the tin price crash, not just here, across the whole globe. The right hand end of the graph is why Cornwall isn't necessarily post-industrial with respect to mineral resources. And that is because the demand through the uh, BRIC economies, Brazil, Russia, India, China, has actually led to this huge increase in commodity prices. Note the recovery after the 2008 crisis. So that is what makes the difference between profit and loss and whether the extraction of materials is actually likely to take place. I'll come on to what the implications of that may be for uh, Cornwall uh, later on. If we look at the distribution of mineralisation around Cornwall, as Hadrian hinted, it's ultimately most of it is related to the granites. So the red splodges on this geological sketch map are the granites. The blue that you see is where we have tin mineralisation, which is dominant. The yellow is where copper mineralisation has taken place. And we've got lead, silver, zinc being dominant types. Not all of that is related to the granites. You'll note some of these white rectangular boxes. There's actually a separate later episode of mineralisation after the uh, emplacement of the granites as, as igneous rocks near to the Earth's surface. It is unrelated to that igneous activity. And there are a series of other um, commodities that have been derived. Of these, arsenic is quite important historically, but the black uh, star you see here is tungsten. And we've seen important production historically from the Campbell and Redruth area. And current at the moment, just to the east of the Tamar, 
is the Hamadan project, which I'll talk about uh, later on. And this uh, graph shows uh, basically the distribution of mine production of these metals relative to the granite contact. And you can see that tin, tungsten, copper and arsenic are all very strongly correlated with the granite. And that's because the fluids that were carrying these metals naturally emanated from the granite. But it also, interestingly, or interesting to me, shows that um, those metals have largely, across the region, been worked not in the granite, but largely in the surrounding country rock into which the granites uh, were injected. Zinc, lead, <laughs> silver and iron have a less clear relationship. The iron picture is skewed by most production being associated with the St. Austell granite. And the other three, zinc, lead and silver, <coughs> are controlled by this episode of mineralization which isn't related to the granites, what is known as cross-course style mineralization, or a better moment. So, as Hadrian was saying, the granite is all important, but um, the relationship as to where the metals are being precipitated, it doesn't have to be within the granite. So, when did all this happen? Let's do a quick uh, reminder for my group yesterday. The Earth is 4.5 billion years old. All right, that's some interesting estimates. This is our home, we live here, all right? And I was intrigued to know that you didn't have a clue, basically. <laughs> so, this is a geological time scale, and we're, sorry, I'm obviously being a little harsh, but uh, I cannot tell a lie. And if we look very quickly at what was happening to southwest England in the Devonian period, we actually have uh, an ocean, basically, that was lying to the south of us. During the Carboniferous, we, we moved two plates together, collided them, and as a consequence of that, we then have the granites being generated in the Permian period of geological time, and associated with that, we had the generation of mineralization. And then we had this second episode of mineralization, slightly later in the Triassic, which isn't related to fluids coming from crystallizing granite. And of course, the complete, as those who've got the Cornwall have already seen this last October, we have the dinosaurs here, right, just to keep you reassured. And we wouldn't have any of this had we not stripped off all of the chalk which covered the peninsula up till about 50 million years ago. When we opened the Atlantic, remember the Atlantic didn't exist 60 million years ago in this neck of the woods. When we opened the Atlantic, we brought about uplift of the peninsula, which stripped away a covering of Cretaceous chalk. How different the opportunities for artists and miners and everyone else concerned would have been if we were still covered by chalk. Um, we had various suggestions as to what it might have been like yesterday on my trip, certainly. Okay, a bit of different imagery here. Uh, this is a map of a gravity anomaly, and the granites are associated with slightly lower gravity fields above them. That doesn't mean you can go up to the top of Dartmoor on the way home, jump off, and say that you're immortal because that Robin Shale said the gravity field was lower. It's a very small reduction. But it's because the granites are less dense than the surrounding rocks. And we can see that the granites continue from Dartmoor through Bodmin Moor, St. Austell, Carmanellis, Lansdowne, the Isles of Scilly, and beyond. There's also a separate granite at the sea floor, known as Hay Frau, uh, to the northwest of us. And if we, we can describe that as a cornubian batholith, and if we look in 3D, this is how all the individual expressions of the granite, where they uh, are seen at the Earth's surface, they're linked at depth into what we term the batholith, right? basically a large, deep bit of, of rock. And there's probably about 40,000 cubic kilometers of uh, molten rock being transferred from the Earth's lower crust to close to its uh, surface. Let's not worry about that because that's a bit scary. So we'll move on to this bit. Why did all of this happen? Well, this plate collision, continental collision, occurred uh, about uh, 300 million years ago. And we can imagine uh, that we have a lower plate. Now, if you just look at this, is a really good graphic that I did yesterday. My hand is southwest England, a lower plate. The upper plate that's purple ran over the top of it, all right? And that meant the lower plate eventually started heating up and melting. And that's where the granites came from. And um, the melting that we see to produce the granites is limited to this zone immediately underneath 
the plate which overrode southwest England. Now, some of you will say, what about this one? Well, we'll talk about that one over coffee. And just to prove that we're in a, a mountain belt, this is what we see, North Cornwall, Mullachaven, all right? This is what happens in mountain chains. Himalayas, Alps, right on the go. We fold and squidge rocks. Okay, that's enough geology. Let's uh, consider the first trip. Um, this is um, a photo of the Campbell and Redruth mining district uh, just over 100 years ago. One of the most intensely uh, mineralized areas of ground within the United Kingdom a world-class mining uh, area. You may think there's nothing world-class about that, right? But by world-class, what we mean is the, uh, the richness of the deposits, and in the case of Southwest England, the number of different elements that have been extracted. Calm Bray provides a great viewpoint uh, down over this area. So we'll, uh, we'll visit there. And this is a geological map. The photo you just saw was looking back eastwards and all the areas shaded in here is what you're looking across. These black lines that you're seeing running roughly northeast southwest are the mineral loads. And I can hear you say, I've never really understood what a mineral load is. <laughs> <laughs> a mineral load is basically where we fracture the rock. So we fracture the rock, move it apart, and um, fluids that are being given off from the granites below can migrate through those fracture systems, faults typically, and out of those fluids we can precipitate new minerals and they will be the metal bearing minerals if we're lucky that we can later exploit. So what we have to do is mine or extract that area of rock and it's typically very steeply inclined in most cases and it may have an extent horizontally of hundreds of metres to in some cases a few kilometres and it may have an extent vertically of hundreds of kilometres as well, as well, hundreds of kilometres, hundreds of metres as well. Try to get a grip, boy. Um, <laughs> right, so we went to the top of Calm Bray, and we saw a monument. So we have a monument built by public subscription. Mm. Alan might have more to say about that later on, to the local mineral lord, um, as part of the Bassett family, we had a very nice pad out at Tahiti, to the northwest of the main mining area. And we talked very briefly uh, a little bit about world heritage status. This is one of the ways we view our extractive past through the fact we've got UNESCO um, status. This is actually where the great flat load runs. And as I said to my group yesterday, not really flat because it was inclined to about 30 to 40 degrees, but it was a lot flatter than most other loads in Cornwall, so that's why I thought it's known. It's about six kilometres long, so actually one of the major structures in this area. And looking out toward the northwest, sorry the light wasn't great, um, we can actually identify South Crofty Mines. Some of you might just be able to make out the headgear. And on the other side of the road, the Heartlands Project, which is where the Robinson shaft has been redeveloped as part of a regeneration project costing £35 million, which we also visited. So what's the story here? I don't know. I don't do stories. That's what you all do. So what can we see? Um, what I can see is subtly, I can see a distinctive orange sign there, which is a B and Q sign. <laughs> I can see an advert for our new cultural playground, which is on this side, and I can see the remains of mining industry on the west side. And we've got this great mix here of an area where we've made the transition on one side of the road, which used to be part of the South Crofty mindset. Whereas we've got 50 people working on the other side who are still convinced that they can make a go of mineral production. So there's many uh, areas that we could exploit there, that explore. This site used to be part of an engineering company, Holman's. It's now got a B&Q on it. But obviously there's a story there that runs through many former industrial uh, sites. So rather than producing things, we sell things to each other. So we met the current chief, uh, <laughs> chief, sorry, chief operating officer uh, who ran through some of the plans that they have. There's about 50 people employed there. And the project has a, attracted quite a lot of derision, but there's one thing certain, it costs a lot of money, between about 200 to 300,000 pounds a month, because they're drilling boreholes to try and work out what's present in the former Dolcoth mine on the other side of this area. And we looked at some of their models of old mine workings in this area um, to actually understand the three-dimensional geometry, and that attracted quite a lot of interest of some of the people within my group. We talked about stories of... Uh, yeah, sorry, can I have a 
the sun readers can probably tell. No, I'm not. Um, uh, Indium is present there in trace amounts. Now, obviously, if you can flog to a potential uh, investor the fact you've got Indium, this very precious metal there, then you might get a bit more money for your next phase of exploration. So all of this is, is good stuff. Uh, and I'm implicated in this because this is work we did at the School of Mines, just to say, look, there is Indium actually present here. We also then made the uh, transition across to Heartlands. And I know that some of you in my group are thinking, he's either brilliant at Photoshop, or um, it wasn't quite like, yeah, yeah, I had actually been there before and took photographs in the sun just to provide that extra little sort of blend. This was on uh, the opening weekend. This is the old Robinson shaft until 94, was used as the main access <coughs> route for men going into South Crofty uh, Mine. And it's been transformed, the whole site, quite a lot of remediation, into a multi-purpose space, which is meant to be a gateway to the uh, World Heritage Site, but also a community space as well. And we had quite an interesting discussion uh, with uh, people involved, and throughout the day, actually with former miners as to what they thought of it when we went on to a different site. Here's the view from the engine house. Hmm, looks very, I don't know what, looks very, doesn't look like Cornwall, does it? Right, okay. And I couldn't help but look across the road. This is a view taken from Heartlands back the other way to South Crofty on the other side of the road. So it's, it's very interesting. Very good juxtaposition of different ideas there. We moved on um, to the School of Mines test mine that was formerly run by the Holmans com uh, Company. And Mark Kazmarek is actually a Cornwall councillor, but uh, he helps us out with some of our work at our training mine. And he was showing us here how to uh, uh, charge holes for a blast and we got various people uh, involved here. So we had a bit of uh, affirmation making sure there's no gender politics here. We had someone set off our blast which was pretty bloody loud wasn't it? It was uh, <laughs> something. Uh, probably uh, got rid of about, I don't know, maybe five kilograms of explosive. It was quite loud. <laughs> and Abigail, who can't be here unfortunately, uh, we had a bit of a, uh, she's cradling a piece of granite which I'd given to her for one of her uh, projects. But by chance, this was actually the site the granite came from, uh, where drilling was done for test work for characterization of the rock for disposal of radioactive waste a long time ago. Uh, nothing came of it, you'll be reassured. Um, but this is where it came from. So it's a kind of taking coals back to Newcastle type scenario. <coughs> so we could actually see uh, these boreholes are actually where these granite cores uh, were, were produced. Okay, the second trip, which I wasn't on, but Sam Hughes, my PhD student, ran, went to uh, basically a, an 18th century mine which reworked in the 19th century and tried to rework in the early 20th century, Condoro mine. And they had the experience of going down a, a small shaft and ladders, which I, I gather was quite interesting for some of you. Uh, and then, well, look at this, authentic pictures from Sam here, dark and moody underground, <laughs> and just a little bit damp, I suspect, in that section of the mine. Following that, they went to King Edward Mine, and both of these sites were formerly run by the School of Mines before being handed over to charities, and they learned something of the techniques of mineral processing, whereby once you've extracted the, the material out of the ore, out of the ground, how you then separate out of it the valuable components. And there was, it's, it's a superb site to understand basically what was going on 100 years ago in terms of technology, and in some cases more recently than that, but uh, it was state of the art 100 years ago. And then they made the transition across to the School of Mines. And we're now based on the uh, Tremo campus, uh, so a joint venture between University College of Falmouth and the University of Exeter. And we've been around since 1888, which was a spectacularly bad time to set up a School of Mines in Cornwall because the industry was in pretty bad shape. Copper had, in essence, finished. Uh, arsenic was helping along a little bit in those sorts of loads. Tin was about to go through a major decline in the 1890s. And the only reason that we survived is that, although politically incorrect to say it, our graduates were shipped out to the pink parts of the then British Empire, the pink parts of the map, and very rapidly established a reputation for being able to get a job done in terms of the uh, sort of extracting minerals. We've moved once before in the mid 70s to a site just 200 metres away from uh, Heartlands, where reassuringly we used to be able to have our windows vibrated by South Crofty blasting 700 metres below us in the afternoon, which is a nice feeling. But just to show that there's two sides to every coin, we're also involved with the biggest renewable energy research project that's taken place in the UK, the Hot Dry Rocks Project, which I know that Hadrian touched upon and Tony Bennett 
on uh, your two, your Invisibles tour. And it's come full circle because there's now two projects, uh, one based uh, at Eden and one at Kahara, just outside Red Roof, that are looking to drill into the granite to exploit uh, this resource. And I know that Hadrian will talk uh, more about that. We relocated. We had no option. We'd have closed if we stayed where we were. Uh, recruiting students to post-industrial camp on Red Roof is not easy. Um, and so we had to be wherever the major university development was. But basically, we're still producing graduates who are going out worldwide. And it's a continuation of the Cornish diaspora in a slightly different way. They're not all Cornish. They come from all over the UK and internationally. But they come through Cornwall, and they extract that knowledge that expertise, and then go out and work elsewhere. OK, well, it's OK, Hadrian, don't panic, we're almost there. Um, the group at the School of Mines also saw state-of-the-art uh, facilities for how we image and characterize ores. The pretty colors are just different minerals. And the issue, from an economic point of view, is if you have complex what's the term, polymetallic ores like this, <laughs> How do you actually separate these individual components? Because if you can't separate them, in many instances, you don't have a saleable product. And these images are actually areas that are about 10 to 15 millimeters across. And individually, they represent five to six million individual analyses by um, basically an, what's known as an energy dispersive analyzer. So it's a, a beam technique. So these are all created by an individual pixel where the software has assigned it to a particular mineral. And that's how we map what's going on here. It's a great quantitative technique. And just to put this into context, you don't need to know what the minerals are. Just look at the pictures, the colors. And what I'm going to do is separate this image, which is a, uh, an example of ore from South Crofty, into the individual components. <coughs> and that single block you just saw comprises chalcopyrite, cassiterite, wolframite, spalerite, arsenopyrite, pyrite, quartz, chloride, fluoride, all of which you have to be able to effectively separate. And these are some of the major technological challenges if we're going to have uh, working of polymetallic ores uh, within, uh, within Cornwall. But just, to, just to develop this idea of diaspora, these are students who graduated last year. I teach largely on the geology program. just want to emphasize this. Look where they're ending up. Hong Kong, Australia, Mali, Zambia, Ecuador, Congo, who's still alive, Georgia, uh, Hong Kong, <laughs> Congo, all right? So, it's still going on, and you shouldn't think that you know, our connections globally have ended. We are still providing people uh, from Cornwall, exporting still that technology uh, throughout the world. Okay, what about the future? We have to cross the border for a clear view of the future of mineral exploitation within this region. This is on the southwest corner of Dartmoor, an area that has experienced massive mining activity historically, both here at Hemmerden as a tungsten resource, developed improperly and imperfectly in the First World War and the Second World War, when tungsten was required for armaments, but also by massive China clay operations. And this site has been known as a resource for a, uh, just coming up for 100 years. But with the collapse in prices in the 1980s, the project could never be taken forward. An Australian uh, company, appropriately named, I suspect, for many of you, Wolf Minerals, has taken over, because Wolframite is the mineral, uh, but that's not the only reason you think it was Wolf Minerals, I suspect, has taken on this site, and they are currently developing this. It will be the world's fourth biggest tungsten mine. This is a world class mine. It's happening here in southwest England. And yes, it's going to be a great big hole in the ground, right? like the other big holes in the ground adjacent, but it will generate probably 200 very well-paid jobs. And tungsten, there is a stranglehold on it from China. China are not exporting their tungsten concentrates because they want to have the added value of putting uh, out finished products. So this is actually quite an important development. This is what uh, wolframite looks like um, in a hand specimen. And this is basically what the estimates are of how much material there is there. And this is what geologists do to come up with statistics to try and assess the risk of going forward uh, with the project. This is happening. This is real. It's happening now. It's not speculative. Whether or not projects elsewhere take off depend upon confidence in the exploration that's going on, the results they come across. And I would say that if metal prices continue at this level, certainly you should be aware that 
Cornwall still has resources that are available. Mining didn't finish here because we ran out of resources. It finished here because the economics weren't right. And we still are resource rich. Thank you.